Welcome to the third day of Sahara TV Town Hall meeting titled Democracy on Trial. My name is Rudolf Okonkwo. Today, there were revolution now protests across some cities in Nigeria, cities like Lagos and Abuja. Nigerians came out to express their displeasure on how democracy has been going on in Nigeria. As expected, security men came out in large numbers to intimidate protesters. Some were even arrested. Yesterday, one of the top news headlines was that Nigeria had increased the fine to impose on anyone accused of hate speech from 500,000 naira to 5 million naira. And joining me to co host this town hall today is Temi Tope Gomez. Tope, hello and say hello to our audience. It's a pleasure um, to have you all join us for this uh, panel discussion, Democracy on Trial. And here are today's guests. Uh, we have uh, Baba today, Baba Ye, as a matter of fact, Dele Faru Timi, Olariwaju Suraj, Yemi Adamoleku, Dele Faru Timi, and Omoye Le Shore. Let me start by going to Omoye Le Shore, because um, a year ago, we all know what happened to him when he was in Nigeria, in Lagos, and he wanted to lead a demonstration like what happened today. And he was arrested. And it's been a year, and he's still in the process, in the legal process. So you're welcome to the town hall. Thank you. Thank you for bringing me in. Uh, Can you tell us, um, first of all, let's start from today. What happened today? What did you see today when you were out there, I believe, in Abuja? Uh, we had a nationwide, actually a global call for revolution. It's been a year after we had the last one. And uh, uh, when we had the last one, we promised that the days of rage would continue until the country called Nigeria is totally and fully liberated from its internal colonizers. And so, and then our citizens across the world, not only Nigeria, because we had uh, people who participated from the UK, uh, Canada is going on any moment from now. So far, I had uh, participants from several cities. In Abuja, as it is uh, now normal, uh, they brought out uh, security forces, soldiers, air force, I mean, police, and clamped down protesters who peacefully walked into the Unity Fountain. Over 40 of them were arrested. Uh, we've succeeded so far in getting them released. I called the commissioner of police in Abuja and uh, told him categorically that uh, they are violating the rights of uh, the citizens who came out to protest today. He agrees with me, but he uh, said that he has to try them for violating uh, COVID-19 protocols. But I insisted that they all had face masks and uh, they, were, they had not even arrived to observed the, uh, the protests before they were, they were arrested and beaten up. A lot of them were beaten up, badly beaten up. And uh, he later uh, released them, of course, reluctantly. We have people in Lagos who have been held on the bridge. Two of them have had uh, heart attack, panic attack, but the police have not let them go. They are in hospital now. These were people who were driving from Victoria Island, mostly women. Uh, to join protesters on the island. Also, in the Keja, right, right now we still have over 20 protesters who have been detained at uh, the notorious Area F. Uh, area F is, used to be known in political cycles as the Area Finish. Uh, they have still been detained as we speak uh, there. So, but it was uh, very successful. We had people protest in Kano, Kaduna, Niger, also the DSS, the lawless DSS, has arrested again, Olawale uh, uh, Mandate, uh, who was uh, detained with me last year, he's now been rearrested again today. And there's, there are videos on Twitter and elsewhere uh, to show how people were maltreated uh, today across the country. But the good news is that uh, more and more people have jettisoned fear and decided that they will confront the system because they're no longer happy or satisfied uh, or uh, carried away by the nature of democracy we have in Nigeria, which I uh, have repeatedly referred to as a morontocracy. 
which is uh, government for morons by morons. Uh, you know, that's that become the order of the day in Nigeria. So that's where we are. That's uh, the latest report from the field. We are aware that more and more of our citizens are still going to engage in protest today. And uh, we'll review at the end of the day. I cannot speak for the, the organizers. Baba Aye is here, who is the co convener of uh, Coalition for Revolution, is on this show. So, but that's uh, the report from Marion of uh, Town. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Baba Aye, can you give us uh, an update from, from where you are, please? Uh, well, um, thank you very much, uh, Rudolf. Uh, and all comrades, yeah. Today was um, very successful in several ways, uh, considering the extent of repression that was faced, um, despite uh, all attempts by the state, just like with last year, to, to repress action been taken, and our demands been expressed in the most uh, concrete manner. Uh, we had uh, actions taken in a number of uh, cities and states, including uh, Lagos, Ondo, uh, Oshogo, Ogo State, Abeokuta, uh, Abuja, Kano, uh, Cross River, Calabar, where they even also submitted uh, their petition to the um, governor. Uh, Quara, uh, I mean, those are the ones I can immediately uh, remember. Uh, a lot of these uh, were not as large as we had uh, mobilized towards, largely because. Just also like last year, it had to be uh, a, a sort of a cat and mouse game with the states, with the police, uh, in virtually every, in, fact, in everywhere, all the announced venues had been taken over by the police uh, and they kept monitoring around. Like in Lagos, they initially came uh, after they had taken over the uh, announced um, uh, location and uh, comrades at the nearby uh, started uh, the demonstration. They came, disrupted um, with tear gas uh, and uh, dispersed uh, the protesters. But the protesters regrouped, you know, and uh, that was when they still came back, uh, the police and swapped on uh, protesters and uh, arrested uh, uh, 22 persons uh, and moved them to, to area finish. Uh, and um, efforts had been made to also uh, secure their release now. So, uh, but the greatest of uh, the, the the success is what you can you, you see you see the confidence in 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 a new layer of activists a lot of whom we are also involved last year it's like it, it's a consolidation of a revolutionary consciousness without which and Kedas bearing such consciousness without which you cannot. Uh, bring to about a, a, a new a new a new yes, mode of struggle, a massification uh, of, of of what is to be to change society, and to better understand uh, the success of what has happened now. Uh, I pointed out in a number of um, polemics last year um, with comments that I mean I. I have been involved uh, in, in leadership roles in virtually all the coalitions since uh, the campaign for democracy. I worked with Berko as a member of the National Implementation oh, Committee. Uh, I was a founding member of the United Action for Democracy and served at a point as its national convener. What am I trying to draw out in all of this is that you are now having a, a process in which the coalitions themselves have been able to hold a broad layer of activists committed to that revolutionary struggle and ready to come out and fight on a sustained basis. And this is very crucial for the battles that lie ahead and the struggle for the revolutionary transformation of Nigeria. Thank you so much. Uh, if you're just joining us, we're having a town hall meeting and we're talking about democracy on trial in Nigeria. And we want to uh, announce that we now have Femi Aborishade who, is, uh, who has joined us. Uh, let me come to you, Dele. Dele, what is your experience? How do you uh, evaluate what happened today and put it in the larger context? Do you think, like Shore said, that we are, we are at the point where a lot of people are buying into the need to do something and change the situation of things? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Just before we came on here, 
I was having a chat with Babaye, and one of the things that came out was that we, as a generation of activists, and even the ones before us, we made a horrible error. We have mischaracterized the nature of our struggle. We framed what should correctly be identified as a liberation struggle. We had framed it as though it be a pro-democracy struggle. And that mischaracterization has affected the manner in which we have mobilized in the past for the struggle that is before us. Now, let me particularize it to the question you have asked. Thanks to Yele, a lot of people who were asleep a year ago are awake now. I was one of those. The point is this, democracy cannot be on trial in Nigeria because we do not even have a democracy. Democracy is on trial only when a man's vote counts for something. And that can only happen when the man has even the right of citizenship. So where are we today? We're in a better place than where we were a year ago. A year ago, they were going to force all sorts of legislations down our throat. They were going to just write roughshod over all of us and we were busy speaking grammar until it pleased Yele and God blessed him to decide that he wasn't going to be normal like the rest of us. And it was in his own consistent insanity that the rest of us heard the bells that we needed to hear because we realized that if the state would treat Yele the way he was treated, for bearing no harms. It then simply meant that our own days were numbered. So Yale's self-immolation a year ago was sufficient to awaken a whole lot of other people. And it has catalyzed the movement. As Baba here had mentioned earlier on, what's that movement? It's simple. If you consider the fact that a year ago, myself and Yale were not talking, there are people today who are talking to each other, exchanging ideas, synergizing, who are not even talking to each other a year ago. So yeah, we are not where we were a year ago, but I think it is critical that we examine the content of the struggle that is in front of us. It's not a pro-democracy struggle. It's a liberation struggle. Okay, thank you. It's a liberation struggle. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Abarishade, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I know you've been uh, in this struggle for a long time and uh, you are still part of it. How do you put this in historical context in terms of what happened today or where we are today? Mm. Uh, uh, let me first of all say I'm not a doctor. Oh. I need to correct that uh, impression. But I think in answering your question, I think the critical issue is to correctly understand the nature of the Nigerian state and the social force that can bring about an enduring change. The Nigerian state uh, was conceived, born, nurtured, and sustained as a terrorist state, waging wars against the interests of ordinary people. The history of Nigeria really has always been till today a history of dictatorship from colonial military dictatorship to local domestic military dictatorship and today the civilian dictatorship. The state, all it knows what to do is to wage war against the interest of the people. Therefore, we need to understand the social force 
that can change that situation. In my own opinion, it is the organized labor that occupies a strategic position in the capitalist economy. Workers, members of uh, the Avilas of Nigeria Labor Congress and the Trade Union Congress, they are present in all the nooks and crannies of Nigeria. And by saying organized labor, it does not necessarily mean the leadership. By organized labor, I mean members, long term members of organized labor. We need to entrench ourselves, our influence within the working class so that we can use that influence to articulate and include the yearnings and aspirations of other oppressed strata to build formidable uh, forces based on ordinary rank and file members of society, predicated upon a program to change the system, rather than participating along with them in the system of, I mean, in system, I mean, in uh, struggles, electoral struggles, for regime change. It does not mean that we should not participate in electoral struggles. No, I think we should participate where and if we have uh, the forces, the influence, we should participate and show to the masses that this road, the electoral road, is actually not the road to liberation, not the road to emancipation, but we need to take the masses through it. And we are possible if we have, if we are able to bring about pressurized for changes in the electoral system, such that political parties could exist in, in words, if the influence of that political party is limited to the world. Politic, political parties should be allowed to exist if the influence is limited to the local government, political parties should be allowed to assist if the influence is limited to a state. But to, to continue along the line of building political parties as if they are national institutions, radical change, I mean, radical forces may not have the means, the resources to do that. We need to wage struggles to ensure that the, there are electoral changes to allow small parties to operate as political parties within the area of the limited influence. If possible, they can now enter into electoral, electoral alliances on a state basis, on a regional basis, or on a nationwide basis or predicated upon the working class that would articulate you know, the interests of the other oppressed parties. I think that is where we are today. I think uh, it is good for some of us uh, when, I mean, it doesn't mean that uh, if labor is not ready to move, that we should fold our arms, but we should realize that there are limitations when we are unable to uh, move along with, with labor. There are always limitations. Some of us had, um, had uh, made such efforts in the past and will continue to, 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 to thread that path, we will not fold our arms, but we should re recognize the need for a broad-based organization, all organizations. And I think that challenge faces us today. 2023 is just around the corner. We should not allow the ruling class, the traditional ruling class, 
to 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 present themselves under different political platforms as if they have changed. We need to come together. Radical forces must come together, you know, form electoral, uh, re organize electoral, electorally, based on electoral alliances, and participate in the 2023 election. While Thank at you. the same time being involved in the practical struggles of medical workers who have consistently been going on strike, we need to identify with them. We need to deepen their, their demands. And we need to pressurize that labor should call nationwide strike actions. Thank you very uh, much. Particularly. Uh... particularly Hello? Yeah, thank you very much. We appreciate your insight as far as that is concerned. Uh, let's just uh, give others uh, an opportunity to still comment on some more issues. We'll still get back to you, Barrister uh, Fenaboshadi. Um, Mr. Mayor Shilowe, let me just uh, take you up on this. Um, some, of the, some of the opinion that Buhari has uh, foolishly picked the wrong uh, fight because he has uh, actually caused a, chosen a showdown with a movement that is difficult to be heard. Uh, one begins to wonder, where do you project the outcome of this battle for democracy uh, to head uh, for Nigerians? And what are the chances of survival and success of the revolution now uprising? I think I will align with Dele with regard to we should stop calling this a pro-democracy fight. And that's why we opted for revolution immediately after the last election, because I don't want to be under any illusion that the structures in place today in Nigeria can guarantee any to come of free and fair or credible elections. They, they, have the, they have rigged everything against us. So we are back in the trenches, same way probably uh, our forefathers or our forebears were in the trenches since 1948, you know, uh, when they were fighting for independence. We need a brand new nation and brand new struggle for freedom and liberation. That's the way I take it, is the way Daily defined it appropriately. How it will end, I am not going to predict that, but I know that there's never a time that the oppressive forces in any nation has ever defeated the forces of conscience uh, in any nation as well. And I know I can predict that this will end well for the people because now more and more people have uh, joined the fight. If you were on Twitter today, it was uh, very interesting to find some women, mostly women who were driving from Victoria Island in fancy cars decorated with uh, their revolutionary messages when they were confronted by the police, one of them wearing the hat of the revolution now with authority confronted the police. And she said something I could never forget. She said, you know, my kids and my family are US citizens, but we love this country and we will fight to save it. You know, that's how best I can frame what she said. As we speak, these women are still being held up by the police. One of them has, a, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a mild heart attack, the other one has panic attacks in a hospital, but surrounded still by the police uh, for standing up against the state. So you're going to have more of this, uh, and this is going to escalate more as more and more people get sick and tired of this fraudulent system of government or governance in the country, of which even those of us who started it might become spectators when it becomes full-blown. Now, now, let me ask you, Shore, um, in an interview, you said something, recent interview, you said that uh, uh, Shibanjo and uh, Tinubu, they have been used and dumped. And you, you said something I wanted to clarify, that the, the, the Yoruba nation, there is no value for the Yoruba if Nigeria disintegrates. I, I ask that question because some people believe, watching the people who are here, they believe that the group of activists for good governance and uh, and uh, democracy that they have failed. That at this point there are people who believe now that 
<clears throat> Nigeria to disintegrate. So you have the Oduduwa Republic people, activists, you have the Biafrans. How do you now say, do you, do you think that you have more people on your side who are still talking about how to reform Nigeria, how to make it a better country uh, than the people who are on the side of breaking it up? I have been quoted several years saying that breaking up Nigeria is not going to solve any problem. And why I said that is based on 30 years of experience fighting for good governance in Nigeria. And I've seen several of the forces, including those who are asking for Nigeria to break up today, not knowing, most of them not understanding the implications involved. I am not stuck with Nigeria. It's, you know, being stuck with Nigeria is like asking somebody in a bad marriage not to leave even though they get uh, beaten up every day. What I'm saying is also that the bad husband in Nigeria is also present in all the, you know, all the surrounding nation states that are, you know, hoping that when they break up, things will be all right. I read something yesterday. It was a statement given by, it was uh, something Fela said in his book, uh, written, written by, um, I think uh, the author of one of his, the, I think the guy is from Brazil or somewhere. I don't remember his name now. Uh, but the title of the book, I think, is This Beach of a Life or, you know, something that interesting. And he said, he was telling, they, they were accusing him of visiting the uh, Inspector General of Police, Yusuf, uh, and thanking him or giving him a gift. And he said, he listed all the Yoruba people that have made his life miserable, you know, at Dewusi, who was the Inspector General of Police then, he mentioned MKO Abiola, and all these Yoruba people who made sure or who swore that his life would never, he would never achieve peace or progress, including Obasanjo who burnt down his, uh, his shrine in those days, his house, Kalakuta Republic. And it's the same thing I said to people who are talking about Yoruba nation. I say, if you don't deal with the bastards from the area, when they break up, they just, just follow you and destroy you in your nation. But if we have a revolution now, uh, we can decide, even after the revolution, to have a constitution that is uh, made by the people and put in whatever clauses we think might suit uh, the future of uh, the so-called uh, nation of Nigeria. I've also been quoted several also saying that Nigeria never became a nation. It was a business set up for the British and it remained a big business. And the people managing it are just business people who do it, who manage Nigeria for, you know, for profiteering purposes. And you've seen that even with the recent revelations with the Niger Delta region. And I'm saying this so that people can understand very deep uh, understanding of what is wrong with Nigeria. So if you break up, for example, and you have a Niger Delta country or the South-South, or let's even assume that Biafra and Niger Delta becomes one. And then you still have a Pabio uh, in that Niger Delta. You have the guy who was fainting at the National Assembly in the Niger Delta. You have all these criminal elements in the Niger Delta who have trained as thieves, as killers, as kidnappers, as uh, wicked souls in this Nigeria. So they follow you there. What are you going to do? And I also did say that to you, Khan, when I met him. You met him shortly after I met him uh, in New York. I'm sure the security agencies are waiting for you when you arrive <laughs> for that meeting. But I told him, I said, the same thing I said of the Biafran nation, like, I have studied the place very well, including Yoruba land everywhere. I said, I know. Without fighting the revolution now, we still have to fight it in the Biafra nation because you can't last six months in the Biafra nation that you are talking about now, going by the kind of uh, very devilish, dangerous, wicked uh, people that are going to be there. How do you fight these people? How do you just say, okay, how do you, you can't, you may not even be able to win a general election in Biafra even though you are the one who fought for the, the liberation of the place. So let's all work together and have a revolution in which the playing field can be level for everybody. We decide on a new constitution. And after trying to make this Nigeria work through justice, 
uh, and, you know, law order pro progress, economic, um, you know, uh, equality, you know, and egalitarian society for everybody. We can then decide whether I want to live or not. So that's why I have not given up on Nigeria. And I've also said, and I've said this last day, being a Pan-African and a widely traveled person who loves space, I always like, you know, I'm even dreaming of a United Africa, not even United Nigeria alone. So that, that's, that's where that is coming from. But those who are pushing for a breakup of Nigeria, go and look at the people who are behind them. The current ones I've seen are people who are using it to negotiate with their friends up north. That's, that's, that's what they are doing. I also mentioned yesterday about uh, the Amotel the security outfit in Yoruba, in the Southwest that they created. Today, you can't find any of their vehicles anywhere. You know, it was just a show off to negotiate or to scare some of their friends up north and say, look, you know, we have people too. We've been through all this before, you know, but it's not sufficient to build the new nations around. And the finally, you know, I said, if you break up Nigeria and Biafra, I like talking about Biafra, it's Christmas tree at night, you know, had powerful economic growth and indices, great schools, you know, and you know, you can get jobs in Biafra. What do you think everybody would do? Everybody would move to Biafra. Even some of us are abroad, we just relocate to Biafra because it would be the place to be. And then we will overwhelm Biafra's resources and Biafra will break up because we won't be able to take the weight of all the poor people around it who are, you know, who will be moving in. So that, that was my position. Thank right. you very much. Uh, let me just uh, jump in here um, because it will be a remiss. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Moya. Uh, bye bye. I would like you to jump on this because it will be a remiss if I do not uh, point this out uh, in the course of this interview. Uh, part of the core demands, I mean, that's a coalition for revolution demands, is uh, the removal of Buhari himself. Uh, I mean, it, it's quite clear that Buhari is the face of this regime. But uh, beneath him, there's an extensive a uh, system of corruption and organized establishment criminals. So, do you think that all this will disappear just because Buhari goes? Yeah. Good. Now, yeah, I will mute it now, I will mute it. Uh, you see, Chima Obani put this in perspective years back when he showed the dynamics between mass resistance regime change and system change. You know, uh, when he pointed out, I mean, with mass resistance, we're fighting for regime change, but regime change has little or no meaning. We're not just, it's, it's not about Buhari. Buhari is in his own case, is in his own class of uh, decadence and obsolescence. But apart from that of him, the state is the instrument of a class, the class of the one percenters, the looters, not only in government, but also, you know, of their friends outside government. So when we talk of revolution now, we talk of system change. What we mean essentially is this. Pool youths, professionals in the communities, being the ones that determines, you know, who are those that serve them in the councils, local councils? Who are those from this that then go, you know, to the state level and then nationally? Because this whole idea of uh, the democracy that it is just about voting. And, no, it is only those few, even if you remove one, if you are still talking even of democracy, because just I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, it was uh, Dr. David Rudolph. He started with, you know, uh, Aristotle, Athens, talking about, you know, uh, Athenian democracy. Uh, but some others have pointed out, like uh, Lucy Parsons, that if you can vote away the power of the rich, the high and mighty, they will make even voting illegal, you know? So if we are talking about removing Buari, we're talking about changing the system that produces him, that allows those few people that are the ones that exploit us in the first place to be the only persons that can rule us. So uh, it won't be something that will just happen in a day, but even the process of the kind of social revolution that is system change, 
is part of what is being done even with this protest, even with this revolution. Because revolution is not just about removing those in power. It is also about the, 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 the working class, the people, the masses, being able to know, assert their power, deepen their confidence and their political understanding. So in further answering it, I'll go back to what uh, Commander Abolishadi was saying. Well, then we are talking of change. Which class, which, which section of society is best positioned you know, to change it. And that is, they say who wears the shoes knows where it pinches. It is the masses, the working masses that suffer, that bear the pains of the exploitation, of the corruption, of the oppression that can liberate themselves. But you have to rise to that consciousness. And that is what the coalition call with the revolutionary movement is doing. Consciousness, you know, uh, emancipate yourself from mental slavery because not but ourselves can free our mind. Two key things are central, not just to kicking out the regime and the class it represents, but also for being able to feel into it, for being able to replace it. And what are those two things? Consciousness and organization. That consciousness is where the issue of conscientization by activists comes in about not only the need for change, but the nature of the change that we require. And the second is organization. And that is where the issue of class comes in as um, comparable as this. But talking of the class team, if you look at it, I'm happy you pointed that it's not just about the leadership of the trade unions. Some of us have been trade union leaders for well over two decades. You talk of the rank and file. The core is not a replacement for the trade unions, but it's like two hands that we clap together. We are, I mean, the, the organizational nature of the trade unions is national and other. But when you look at it closely, that other hand, talking of core, it is not the children of Dangote and Otedola that are there. We are mainly, you know, working children that people from homes that even to go to school with increasing cost. Yes, and you also have professionals like the examples that. Uh, Omo Yere, Omo Yere pointed out, but I thought, like, okay, we could have alternatives. So the masses, the rank and file, are the ones whom we built a new Nigeria, indeed a new world, the kicking out of a Buari, and not just a Buari, but of the class that Buari represents, which is the class in, in Europe, I would say the class of Jekudu Jera, you know, the class of exploiters, the kind of vampires that are sucking the blood of the sufferers. And when you now talk of processes, because if we want to build popular power, the issue of accountability also comes in. You know, We should be able to have people, even right from the grassroots level, that we can easily recall. We can easily recall because there's a power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right now, even though you have recall in the constitution, it is so exceedingly difficult to effect. Then two, anybody that serves us, the minister means servant. These people, your, the elected people are supposed to be servants to the people, but they have become mega that are more powerful than the owners of the houses. So every elected official should earn not more than the salary of an average worker not more than the salary of an average worker. All the books of state should be open, and not even only of state, of corporations. Because it is in the dark that wayo wayo, mago mago, uru uru happens. It is not like now you have Freedom of Information Act, but meanwhile, you go, you know, some things are blocked. Everything should be possible to be put before the people. If you serve the people, then nothing should be kept behind you know, the people. We're also talking of that, what we replace it, the people themselves should be because they, can, they are the main and final guarantors of their own security. Now that you're having police that are supposed to secure us, with the police, the army, they secure more the interest of this group of thieves, this class of oppressors. We are saying, you go for a national youth service to do what? National youth service that is just like Boy Scout, you climb Jangrove and all that. We are saying that if, if you, if, 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 you can go to university, come out, or a tertiary school, go to you. You should be able to be trained to bear arms. 
and to be able to the, 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 the people should be able to defend themselves. We should not, it's not just about that you have a body of armed people that are now used to oppress the people supposedly in the name of the people. So system change entails a number, you know, of procedures, a number of structures being put there, all of which ensure that power is not just deemed to belong to the people, but actually come from the people, is delegated from the people. And you see, without that, no matter, it's, and it's not just Nigeria, people talk about money politics in Nigeria, it's not only in Nigeria, anywhere and everywhere, where it is the same class of the one percenters that are in power, and that is like everywhere in the world. Money rules, I mean, in, in the United States, it is more, it, it is legalized corruption with lobbying. And that is where you see big pharmaceuticals, they have been able, you know, with the, with the lobby to ensure that they keep the prices of drugs up and, you know, ensure that America does not have even the kind of social health uh, that you have in, in Europe. In Europe, every, every advance that has even been won, because it's also important to point out something, and we are clear about this. What we're asking, well, system change is a social revolution. A social revolution is not just a revolution. A social revolution is a series of political revolutions because every revolution is political. Every revolution that triumphs results in shift of power. But when you talk of a social revolution, a social revolution entails the shift of power from a class totally and patapatally away. But that will come with series of political revolutions through which, as I said, the mass gets to understand and also consolidate on their strength, get to become conscious of their historical mission. You know, that is what you had with a friend's Fanon saying that every generation, the lot of its relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it or betray it. And the mission of this current generation of working class people and youth is to struggle for revolution now, is to ensure that people see beyond reformism. We, 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 we defend reforms when we win this, and we realize that even the best of reforms have come only out of fear, only out of fear for revolution by the one percenters. I'll give you an example. A lot of people talk of the NHS in, in the UK and, and the social Europe, but they forget that in 1945, a member of parliament in Europe had to say, hey, Look, if we don't give these people reform, they will give us revolution. And why was this? The reason was that as you were having the strikes in the factories, and that was why I was talking about the two-day clapping, as we were having strikes in the factories, you were having people taking the streets. You were having people taking the streets with the hunger matches, and not just doing this, they had the vision for a post-capitalist reality. So we have to do the, you know, uh, like the Parisians said in 1968, that, you know, uh, we should be modest, we should be realistic and demand the impossible. Because what seems, even things you take for granted today, we are deemed to be impossible a while back. But revolutionary struggles for them brought them about. A hundred years back, very few countries, even in the Western world, women vote. True struggle, now it is generalized. Even few people know that as recently as 1979 in Nigeria, in Nigeria, women in the North could not vote until 79. People like Gambo Sawaba, they could not vote. People fought for this. So why, why this is also important? Because it also helps us understand that even while we are far from where we intend to go, the, the struggles of the past decades have not been in vain. The struggles of the past decades are done. We are now at a stage of moving from quantity to quality. Even the fact that we have a democratic regime in place, it's an advancement, even if not in essence. It is an advancement in form from the khaki jackboot dictatorship. But in essence, it is still the same. And that is what we're saying that we want to move from quantity, from quantitative. We want, you know, what we have been having now is when you have water starts getting hotter, water starts getting hotter, it has moved from room temperature to 60 degrees Celsius and other, but it is still hot. it is still liquid water. We want to take the fucking water to 100 degrees and get steam, steam of mass action that transforms the entire state 
of our society, into one of an emancipated people, into, into one where the, the conditions for growth, in fact, the development, the decisions on development is taken from below by the masses themselves, and thus is in the interest of the masses and the protection of the planet. All because right, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I know. I know if you I allow you to continue. Right, right. No, 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 no. <laughs> we'll, we'll still get back to you. We'll still get back to you. I just want to also say that to our, uh, our audience and viewers that we also still have. Uh, we are having uh, Mr. Olari Waju uh, Suraj, uh, who is also who has joined us and uh, he's uh, also here with us. Uh, we still have uh, Daily Faru Timi uh, and uh, Barista Femi Aborisha with us as well as some of uh, Rudolf, over to you. Okay, uh, Dele, let me let me ask you. Uh, I know that um, people are watching this now, and I want you to use your political analyst cap and uh, tell us what you think. People in Abuja, these people we are talking about, watching what is going on here and what happened today on the street. What what do you think they are saying? What do you think they are saying to themselves? You think that they felt that the people are rising up, the people are or that they laughing, are they drinking and laughing at at what is happening? What do you think? Well, I think to a very large extent, the people in Abuja have themselves come to the point where they must know that they've lost control of the situation. Usually, the easiest way to know when a ship is sinking is that you see the rats jumping off the ship. They keep jumping. The rats in Abuja are already jumping. That's why you are seeing the mess you are seeing before the National Assembly. People are busy fainting and waking. A fainting man had his eye wide open. They had their hand in, in his mouth. We're hearing about a woman with four husbands. We're hearing about sexual harassment in hotel rooms and slaps. It's not accidental. Those are signs of the decadence that are set in and the complete loss of control because of the loss of cognition by our president, who is obviously not in charge. So, Yes, they are sat somewhere now looking at us, but I'm not too sure they are taking us too serious, and I would explain why. I have already explained that as far as I can see, what we are facing is not a pro-democracy struggle, it's a liberation struggle. Now, the worst that will happen to the system based on our current assertions would be implosions, and then the system would emerge stronger from the implosion because the difference between a revolution and an implosion is the presence of an alternative plan. We need to come to the point where we devise an alternative plan that we take to the Nigerian people. And when we are talking to them, we are educating them on the desirability of this alternative view to which we are calling them because it, to save Nigeria right now, you need to have a complete turnaround. There has to be a complete overhaul of the governance system. Our governance system is impervious to change. So those ones in Abuja right now, even if they see the end of this current republic, what would eventually happen is that because, of the, because we don't have a plan to unite the people behind, the man with the biggest gun is always going to be the one to impose order. And when they impose order, what would usually happen is that the fat cats who have always supplied the hams, they are the ones who will eventually determine the shape to a very large extent of what is coming. So yes, we're in a state of flux. Yes, the conscious in Nigeria have never had a better opportunity to sell an alternative vision to the Nigerian people. But we've got to move beyond protesting. We've got to have a plan. There has to be something we are selling to the Nigerian people. Because in the absence of something to sell to them, the system would merely reinvent itself. Okay. What you would have, sorry, please, let's just make this last point and I'll get off. What you would have, is a reenactment of Mugabe out, crocodile in, Al Bashar out, some other joker there. So instead of a revolution, you have implosions that reinvents the system and re energizes it. 
that's the point I would like to make. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, let, let me come to Comrade Abouisade. Uh, you mentioned what happened in Sudan. Uh, well, people would, who have been following Sudan for, for the past 30 years would have thought that it wasn't possible for people to rise up and, and take away uh, the, 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 the military group that, that took over the country. I wanted to ask you, uh, from the laboratory, what is, what is it that the activist group, that the labor union uh, in Nigeria are not doing right, that they haven't been able to get the kind of mass movement that we saw in Sudan? We can see that situation in Nigeria is not that better for, for the labor union, for all the masses. But it doesn't look like um, the activist group, they've been able to convince this large number of people to come out and demand change. What do you think is responsible for that? Well, thank you. I think that um, our problem, our failure, is the inability to organize the rank and file of the trade unions on a consistent basis. And that remains a challenge, not just for activists in the unions or pro-labor activists, but for all those who seek change. Because if we base, if other forces base their activities on the middle class that is unstable, that changes uh, their position based on convenience, based on whether or not the regime in power excludes them, we'll be wasting our time. So, I would encourage even non-pro-labor activists, political activists, to also pay attention to what we need to do to organize support for the rank and file of the Nigerian working people. A good number of them, for example, are not organized. A good number of them are at the mercy of their employers. I know some of, the, some of us render free legal services to many of them. But this is what we are doing currently. It's not sufficient. I recall in the 80s, in the early 80s, after I was sacked for the Nigerian Labor Congress. Many, and I was working as a full-time revolutionary, thinking revolution, working rev revolution, linking up with workers in the factories, organizing education programs for them, writing petitions for them, writing demand, letters of demands for them in various factories. Today, many of us do what we do on a part-time basis, whenever we can afford. No society can change on that basis. We need to free some people who will be full-time revolutionaries. I used to be one. So we need full-timers. And all of us must come together to do that, regardless of our differences in different organizations. Let us form a body to which ordinary people can look up to. Be, be they community people who, are, who have bad roads, who have no electricity, uh, or the unemployed, are uh, unorganized. We need to organize them, support them. So we need that body. 
that will link the struggles of the working class with the struggles of other oppressed strata of society. The working class, in our own Marxian perspective, is the social class that can lead a struggle for an enduring societal change. But the working class alone will not do it. We also need the support of other oppressed strata in society. So not paying sufficient attention to that, not freeing people to be working as full-time revolutionaries will not go far. I think this is a major challenge that we need to overcome. And as Rosa Luxemburg put it, this, the age we are in, we have not seen anything yet. It is either socialism or barbarism. Unless we change the system, the economic and political system, what we have seen today, I mean, it's unfortunate that people are protesting peacefully and are being brutalized. But that is just a tip of the iceberg. It will be worse unless we organize formidable opposition platform and forget about sectarian organizations. Forget about our differences. For as long as we, we want change in the interest of ordinary people, it should not be difficult for us to come together on a minimum program so that we can contribute resources, ideas, skills, and have full-time revolutionaries that will be working for change. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, comrade. Uh, let, let's hear other voices. Uh, we have uh, Yemi. Yemi is the executive director of Enough is Enough. Uh, Yemi, how are you doing? Hello? She's still yet to be on. I, I think we have online. Why don't you Suraj? Is available. Okay. Suraj, how are you doing? Hello? Suraj? Yes, how are you? Good, good. Nice to see you. Uh, so, nice hearing you. Yeah, can you please give us an update? Where are you? What did you participate in today's uh, uh, demonstrations on protests? Well, I actually participated virtually, uh, not physically. Okay. Uh, and um, it's been so disheartening seeing how things are evolving anyway. But it's not surprising. Uh, we're still under the same regime. We're still under the same political class. And it is always... Um, going to be expected as it happens. So it is not the arrest that is the new thing. It is the fact that we're actually uh, succeeding in bringing out, you know, um, the beast in them, you know, uh, irrespective of the pretense and also uh, the claims. Uh, it is uh, like we tweeted on, um, on the social media, similar rallies were by politicians were protected by police and other security agencies. Uh, but once it is for uh, the raising of the consciousness of the people to uh, make demands, then you're expected uh, to have this kind of response that we uh, was attracted today. But the fact that people are still speaking up, uh, it, it, I, I think this, this is one of the things that, that is very crucial. Um, if we're not careful, like uh, the earlier speakers have rightly put it, uh, things are changing. So uh, we, we're not going to get uh, this... Um, Implosion, like, like um, my brother uh, uh, earlier said, you know, we, we implosion would not make any other thing. So implosion would only reproduce the lack of Buhari uh, just once uh, in a while you have this kind of token responses uh, from there. But there's a need to actually dislodge a whole class and a set of people uh, before you can have any change with the system. Otherwise, it's going to be about you know, foreign loans, it's about corruption, and they graduate. So you can see what they do now is to turn into drama. Once they are caught with their hands in the cookie jars, you, all you just see is the collapsing person. It is the banter. Governors will collected whatever bribe. Oh, no, you would find denial. And they keep entertaining the people. And the most unfortunate aspect is that uh, for us, we are actually losing, you know, uh, forces almost on daily basis. If the ones that are lost to them are, 
uh, they are the ones that are also completely disillusioned and not even interested in anything are also there. So uh, there, there's also a need for us to sustain what we're doing and also finding a new ways of not only attracting um, new forces and also followers, but also engaging uh, at the higher pedestal than, uh, that we're doing on the, uh, on the daily basis currently. Mm. All right, uh, Shore, uh, is he still with us? Hello? More or less, Shore? No? All right. Um, I wanted to find out. Um, now, let me, let me jump on what you just said and uh, probably uh, go to... Uh, <laughs> okay. But, but let me ask you about... He was talking about what will happen now. We are, we are approaching 2023. And no matter what we do here and say here, the political actors are basically uh, negotiating. They are plotting for what will happen uh, in the next um, another, another two years. It will all kick in. Is there any way that this movement can stop what they are doing or the plan they have in place? Because if you ask the people who believe that the or more do the do do or do do a republic group. They are saying that they are not going to be part of that election. The Bia France are saying they are not going to be part of that election. Now the, the activist group are saying that you know they are that they, we want a revolution. But the political class are basically negotiating and plotting on how the election will go. How do you think which which part has the momentum to to basically stop uh, the political class from going on and carrying on as if. Uh, all these things didn't happen. Well, um, thanks, uh, Rudolph. The social reality and the struggle towards system change is full of contradictions. Perspectives gives us the advantage of foresight over astonishment, uh, but it is not sorcery uh, or divination. Uh, a lot will depend on the balance of forces. And that's why it was Bertolt Brecht that said that, I mean, if we struggle, we might lose. If we don't struggle at all, we have lost already. Now, relating this to your question, 2023 is an important year because it is an electoral year. Like a number of other speakers, I agree totally that you, you, don't, you don't reduce social change to the ballots. That's why someone like uh, Malcolm X said that liberation is to be won, quote and unquote, by any means necessary. Uh, the elections could serve as moments of sparks, you know? But getting it, even if we managed to overcome the obstacles of resources of anti-rigging and all that and you have a revolutionary government emerging through the polls remember what um ibb said about the possibility of being in government and not being in power you know and that is where the question earlier of gomez of that below buari what of the other uh forces and that is why we're talking of uh social change now, there are permutations, even then, and that's, this is one place where the, uh, the ruling class have been, you might say, smarter. When I say so is that you have seen a lot of greater flexibility and reaching, maybe because it's easier when people are negotiating over who eats more on a very big table on like um, where it is about ideas mainly. And when also those ideas are not rooted in mass movement. Part of the main problem that radical forces have had is that for a long time, except for such sparks like the early period of June 12, we we're talking only to ourselves. And a very important, a very important breakthrough with this movement, the revolutionary movement, is that it is not just a few all-knowing revolutionary ideologues that are talking to themselves in our little bits of organizations. We're talking of thousands, thousands of change-seeking people across the country. 
thinking together, engaging together, debating together, and moving into action on the streets together. That is the source of the alternative form of power that has been built. A lot could happen, 20 days could mean a lot in a political situation, a lot could happen between now and 2023. The, the centrifugal forces of uh, secession, of separationism, they are mainly played up by forces of the same class in power, who use this most times to negotiate on getting larger shares. I mean, look at it. Who, there's, no, there's no ethnic group in Nigeria. There's hardly, let me put it, there's hardly any ethnic group in Nigeria that does not have, at the very least, one or two people on the chopping table of government. Because down to local governments, you know, even for the smallest of the ethnic groups that might have maybe some tens of thousands of, their local governments, the chairman or councillors that are chopping, you know, after so so they, they are but so what we are now saying is that we as a class need to build a, a force, a pan-Nigerian force, which is what core, you know, not seeing itself as the sole uh, answer, but playing a key role, you know, in, in moving forward the mass struggle. Now I want because it's good to learn from our history, including our recent history. I'll give you a clear insight into the importance of state core and for those seeking revolution. Let us go to 2012. Before even 2013. And 2012 played a key role in how 2015 went. The 2012 January uprising, it was partly what, you know, the earlier parties that they matched, they rode on top of. You see a lot of also people on the left that were in 2012 became some of the ideologues of APC. In 2012, we had the most awesome general strike and mass protest in the history of Nigeria. In the history of Nigeria, Nigerian government lost some 3 billion US dollars there about from the shutdown, the mass action. But when the strike was called off, revolutionary forces were saying, no, it shouldn't have been called off and what have you. But we did not have the force to still move forward. If, if, if we had had the kind of force that a core is now, that revolutionary movement could have been pushed further. We could have had our Arab Spring movement, or at the very least, to win concession, not to get to that point, the government would most likely have been forced to even reduce more than what it did. So uh, we are looking at even before 2023, if you remember something Shore used to say before last year's election, when they asked that, I mean, are you for revolution or for power through election? He used to say, whichever comes first. So for us, even the election must be seen as a moment within the process for revolution. It must be seen as a moment for building the, the mass consciousness, the class consciousness of the mass and the independent organization of the mass to be able to fight, to break the chains mentally and physically of exploitation, of oppression, of marginalization, which the 1% foist on us. So uh, we understand the horse trading and all that, but we should see beyond that. We should build our forces. We should consolidate with action and also with education. And that is part of why what we'll be doing as core, we'll be having a series of demonstrations even after this. The next major one will be on October 1. And we're also carrying out mass political education, mass political education to have a strong leadership for revolution before 2023, by 2023, or after 2023. For right. us, that is the way forward. All right, thank you so much. We are going to uh, read uh, some of the emails and some of the uh, comments on Facebook. But before then, I want to go to Yemi. Yemi is uh, she's the executive director of Enough is Enough, and uh, we need a voice of a woman in this conversation. Yemi, welcome to our town hall. Our town hall. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, nice. everyone. Nice to have you. 
So um, I, I don't know what role you play today and whether you watch what happened today in Nigeria and the other parts of the world. Where, where, what do you, how do you assess what happened, the demonstration and the protests and the reaction of the government? It was expected. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what, what what really. It's um, yeah. One was expected. Two. It uh, sort of reinforces what I mean. Sorry, I, I joined the conversation late, but reinforces what those of us on this platform know in terms of how government sees its citizens, the value of life, and sort of repression on freedom of speech and association have been hallmarks of this administration, and they continue to. Um, show that in, in the way they, they engage and react to citizens. But what happened today? Did they strengthen your resolve? Or did, they, um, did you have reasons to feel that the message is not yet getting across? I'm talking about in terms of the participation of the masses. To be honest, I, I wasn't, ex I mean, I haven't, I've seen a few pictures, but I haven't seen a whole lot, but I'll be quite honest, to, I'll, be, I'll be dishonest rather if I expected a lot of people to come out. Um, I, I caught the tail end of what Babaye was saying in terms of building numbers and, and building sort of the base needed to show, to drive this revolution in, in terms that we need it. We're not there yet. We're, we're quite far from it. Um, as we joke around Twitter warriors and a lot of people who speak online, and then when it's time to get out, choose not to. I mean, someone, I tweeted today that I'm not on the streets today, but I'll be part of this conversation. And someone was like, oh, you too, you're not going out on the streets. And one, at this point in time, one needs to be quite clear about what one exposes one to, both in terms of danger and two, in terms of impact. Me going out on the streets today would have had, would, the, the, maybe if I get arrested, it will make, people will talk about it. And by the end of the day, we'll move on. Is that worth my while? I don't think so. But as we continue to build and educate Nigerians, and primarily, I think, help Nigerians connect the dots between their quality of life and the people they have in power, and also be willing to make the sacrifice that is required to, to get to the Nigeria that we want. I don't think we're there. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and also a lot more work in just how people think and how people understand issues. And it's not a party thing. I think sometimes it gets lost in affiliations with political parties or, or, or what's it called, implied affiliations. So sometimes it's seen as, oh, and it's not, it's, for me, it's not an anti-Buhari conversation. It's not an anti-Jonathan conversation. It's just the fact that people who've been elected to serve the people of Nigeria continue to fail in their duties. They were given a job to do. And it's not a job that someone gave. You know, sometimes when you want to get a job, you have to go through an application process, plenty of interviews, and then you get the job. And then there are some jobs that your uncle will just go, yeah, just come, come, come here, you come here, come and sit here and do this work that you don't apply for and you just do it. They applied for these jobs. They spent money, they spent time. They won't do a lot of the money they spent was stolen, but anyway, they spent money, they spent time, but they applied. So people apply for a job and then they are failing at the job. I think the response should be very easy as in, okay, this job that you said you wanted to do, you are not doing it. Can we discuss, are you leaving today or tomorrow? And we need to get citizens to begin to think in those terms. I say it all the time. I say nobody runs a business and you employ staff. And on Monday, the staff strolls in at 11 o'clock. And by three o'clock, the staff has carried back going home. The Monday, the staff shows up at one. And then when you get there, I say, ah, oh, you didn't call that you were coming late. You say, oh, sorry, I forgot. I had fellowship. On Friday, the staff leaves office at 12 if he shows up at 10 because camp is doing something. And so you have people who behave that way. And at the end of the month, you pay them their salary in full. You don't query them. You don't ask any questions. You do that in January, February, March. What is the incentive for people to behave any differently? And so for me, that's how I see politicians. I see them as people who've employed to do a, a job that we honestly are not holding them account to. So we need to help citizens connect that dot. So it's not, and it's not necessarily having to be a national conversation. <clears throat> a lot of them live in houses where we know where they live. Why are we not mobilizing more to encourage people in communities? Femi Bajabi Amela lives in Surulere. So people should go to his house in Surulere and have a conversation with him. The conversation with Femi should not be at Ojota. Go to his house. Let's, if, if 40 people showed up in front of Femi's house and don't move, 
and his wife needs to go out. He, the wife will have a conversation with Femi, Oga, okay, these people are in front of the house blocking the gates. So we need to make them uncomfortable. And I don't think we're doing that enough. We're doing the protests and the conversations in larger spaces where they don't feel it. I mean, I've had several legislators tell me that oh, when you guys come to the National Assembly, we're watching you. And we say, when they're tired, they will go. So until they feel threatened that the people who've employed them are not impressed, neither are they happy, then we might shift a few things. So we still have a lot of work to do, um, but we'll continue. Now, let me ask you, when you say enough is enough, if someone says to you, what is one thing that you can say that is enough and majority of Nigerians will gravitate around it and say, yes, we agree with you and we can take action on that. What is that thing? Okay, so you've asked two questions. We can agree on what is enough, but we will not agree on taking action. And that's where we are. So there are a lot of things we agree on. We agree that security is bad. We agree that lives matter and, and we shouldn't be slaughtering people in Southern Kaduna or wherever else. We agree that the looting is too much. We agree that corruption is this. We agree on a lot of things, but the action is now the problem because unfortunately, as, as some of the things that we've discussed for June 12, people were clear that military is not where we want to be. So to get people to sort of rally around around one action was good. We want the military out. But under a democracy, that's the, that's the downside of a democracy. All of you might agree that looting is bad, but they're APC members and they're PDP members and they're AAC members. And depending on where your uncle is or where your father is or where your sister's boyfriend is, your ability to take action then begins to get a little bit, there's some analysis that we need to do on this action that we want to take. <laughs> so, and then also that obviously also affects people across socioeconomic divides. Now, in terms of who we are speaking to and who has the luxury to take action, if you, and that's part, I mean, from Occupy Nigeria to even COVID, people's ability to respond is also a function of where they are in terms of their economics and how that impacts them and what they see moving forward. So in as much as we're having these conversations, we also need to think through who can do what, who's affected in what way, who can help which demographic, what demographic needs to sit at home and work for mobile, but send money so we can pay for those who have the interest and willingness to come out on the streets, but need to make sure when they go home, they have food to eat. Thank you. Uh, Comrade uh, Abarishade, let me ask you, I know you are you were an associate of uh, Ghani Fawemi, and um, if you were, he were to be alive today, what do you think he will be doing in this current situation? Well, uh, it is not difficult to know what Chief Ganefa and me will have been doing. I know that uh, one of the last uh, mass protests he participated in was initiated by the Nigeria Labour Congress. And against the advice of his doctor, he went out to participate in that protest that held at uh, Ikeja. And uh, he had to leave the place midway because his health could not just take it. In that context, I think that if you were alive today, you would also want to identify with the strike notice that has been issued by the Trade Union Congress of Nigeria, TUC, that said by next week, they'll be calling on their members to down tools and to participate in peaceful mass action. Uh, subscribing organizations to ASCAP, Alliance on Surviving COVID-19 and Beyond, had a meeting today with the subscribing organizations, and we agreed to be part and parcel of the action being initiated by the Trade Union Congress of Nigeria. But because the Trade UC and the NLC are part and parcel of ASCAP, we also enjoined the TUC to initiate meetings with the NLC so that the appropriate organs of the NLC 
could also meet and possibly we could have a jointly agreed date so that as much as possible we can more maximize the participation in the one day of action initiated by the trade union congress so i know if you were alive it will give full backing to that strike notice by the TUC. And the, the, the critical question I want to make in using that as an example to identify what Chief Gadvali would have done is when we participate in actions initiated or embarked upon by any stratum of the oppressed classes, we are participating and working for revolution. We don't work for revolution only when we call our members in our small organizations to participate in protest. We work for revolution. If trade unions are demanding 30,000 naira minimum wage, which has been leg legislated but not paid, and we are part of the struggles to get that legislation implemented. We are working for revolution. When we identify with medical doctors, medical workers, fighting for PPE, personal protective equipment, we are working for revolution. So in essence, I am saying, that the ultimate goal is a socialist change that some of us advocate. But we also identify that we need to find the road to the masses as the struggle for one thing or the other on a daily basis. We must be part or parcel of them. And when we create that bond by participating and identify with them in their day-to-day -day struggles. No, no inducement, no repression by the state can break that bond. So our perception of revolution, our understanding of uh, how to bring about change is important. Mm. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Dele, uh, let, me, let me ask you, I know you're a lawyer and some people believe that part of the, the problems we have in Nigeria, uh, the, most of them are caused by lawyers. Uh, can, can you tell me what happened at the uh, Nigerian Bar Association election? Um, uh, is it part of the problems that we have? And I want you to also comment on what some people believe is the actual problem with the, the country, which is the constitution of 1999. Uh, that that constitution has to go for for Nigeria to begin to um, to be a developed uh, nation or something. What what is your take on this? Now connected to what happened at the M M MBA, uh, the election and everything, is that part of what is um, kind of uh, going on across the country? Well, um, as you said, there are two questions there actually, even though they are related. So I would unpack them. They want to do with the NBA. Before the NBA election, I did write a piece that I had published, and I was clear. I said the I called it the nude dancers of the NBA. The Nigerian Bar Association is meant to be a body of lawyers, those who are sworn to uphold the constitution. Imperfect as the constitution is, it is still the law by which we all pretend to be ruled. So at the end of the day, the NBA circumvented the constitution of this country when it prevented a candidate in that race. But be that as it may, the election is over. We, we as a body, myself and my colleagues in Ramimba, we've been clear in making a very clear statement. There is a president that has emerged. We will watch and see what he will do or not do. But as it relates to law, justice, and Nigerians, and the role of we, the lawyers, 
Let me be clear about this. Nigeria is not a country ruled by law. And when a nation is not ruled by law, it becomes the fiefdom of men who rule with impunity. If we are looking at the fact that we have courts as proof of the existence of law in Nigeria, we will be misled because the law in Nigeria only applies to a class, whilst another class is completely exempted from the operations of the law. This, this, this space occupied by the need to create a super class that is unaffected by law, that space is what has encouraged the impunity that has overtaken Nigeria as a country. When the law does not apply evenly to people across board, people will run around seeking to equalize every disadvantage that has been pressed upon them by the absence of law. So yes, Nigeria has laws, but the law does not rule. Yes, we have courts, but you won't find justice in there. But those are not because they are lawyer, they, because we don't have lawyers or because we don't have courts. It's simply because the law does not rule in Nigeria. So even if you change the constitution until such a time as when you do take steps to change the governance systems, you continue to have the same situation as the one that we have today. The last time Nigerians were ruled by force of their own agreement was in 1966. Everything that has ruled Nigeria since then has been the force of arms and the will of men, not the rule of law. So we don't have a land ruled by law. That's my submission. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we are running out of time, but we want everybody to give a final comments. And then we can read out some of the questions or comments by people uh, who are watching on social media. So I'll start with you, Babaye. Okay, can you give us a final comment? Make it please uh, one minute or two maximum, please. Yeah, I, I would um, want to say that um, we should not see, essentially it's this, of that we have not gotten to point of revolution. I, I think that you cannot really predict how close you are. A spark is enough to spark things. The campaign for democracy had even uh, fewer consistent forces on the field as what core had now. But it was the spark of June 12th that turned that petrol into fire. Uh, because of time, I want to sum up with a, an allegory that uh, Gigi Dara, I would say the old Gigi Dara gave at a guest lecture we invited him for in 1991. He said the relationship between revolution and revolutionary organizations can be captured by the parable of the um, five foolish and wise maidens and the uh, groom in the Bible. Of that, the groom is like a revolutionary, it can come like a thief at the night at any point in time. But the foolish maidens, I don't like, I mean, there is a gender dimension, but it was quoting from the Bible. The foolish maidens are where you don't have consistent revolutionary organizational life. Even if you have the lamp of all the ideologies in this world and sloganeering and all that. But where you have the oil is where you have, because it is people that make history. And so it is essential for us to have the lamp and also to have the oil. And that is, uh, at this point, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with that. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, let me come to you, uh, Danre. Uh, what is your final comment? Lanre, are you with us? Okay, Dele, can you give us your final comment, please? Well, what I would like to say in closing is that the time has long passed when we could enjoy the luxury of ideological okay. purity. We are now in a situation where... Hello? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dele. Uh, yeah, Lana, go ahead. Okay. Dele. Well, we're now in a situation where we should view this as a journey in a bus to the same destination. 
Everybody who desires change in Nigeria, who truly recognizes the need for a revolution in Nigeria, needs to begin to take away that ideological purity that has stopped us from working together as a collective, find the common purpose and interest behind which to coalesce. And having found these common purposes, liking it to a bus, we're all in a bus traveling to the same destination. Some people will fat when we are in the bus, some will cough. As long as we can find the grace to tolerate each other in that bus, it becomes easier to get to the destination together. But the fact is that we must never forget ours is not a pro-democracy struggle, it's a liberation struggle. Our rulers have found a way to enslave all of us. We are the subjects, they are the rulers. The states exist purely for their own interest. We are the losers in this game. We need to change it. Thank right. you. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, okay, Lara, give us your hey, own. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know that my mic was um, still muted. Um, I, I think this this is actually important. My, my um, uh, final comment on this is that we should actually, as much as possible, continue with this trend of this kind of town hall uh, and take advantage of what is um, the COVID-19 or the pandemic situation has brought about. Uh, the need. It's been quite a while since I last had um, share a platform for with uh, Daily Faro to me for instance. I mean, after we've done quite a number of things as uh, the student movement uh, together. Yes, a year we still just talk back. But I mean, and having uh, come from my boy Shadi, you know, I mean, the, like Billy said, this is like a journey that we all need to travel together. Uh, the balkanization to the level of where you have, you know, um, uh, Afeni Feri or Yoruba, whatever, you know, saying one thing, you know, uh, others from the other areas that in terms of IPOB or mass of saying they are not participating. This really is not what we're talking about. This is not about sectional issues. This is not about ethnicity. It's about the problem of a class. And the earlier we, we focus the purpose of our engagement of the political class and not allow the reduction of the larger problem to microeconomic issues or ethnic deprivation to which people will then um, to your own tent, oh yeah, Israel, uh, they're better for us. And the earlier that we also start separating a national issue of the real liberation, like it said, uh, for the Nigerian people, uh, beyond you know, either democratization or uh, inclusion or enthusiasm into the main ruling class, uh, uh, the better for all of us. Uh, there's no ethnic group that is not represented in the current looting class of the country. And if we just want to allow them uh, to reduce that for us and then uh, undermine the potency of the challenges of the people, uh, the, the, the better for us. All right, thank you so much. Uh, comrade uh, Abor please can you help us and round up uh, your comments? Well, thanks very much. In rounding off my presentation, my ideas, I want to urge us to appreciate that though the government might have been able to stop the revolution now protesters today, the economic burden being packaged and imposed by the ruling class of the Nigerian people would compel the masses of Nigeria to fight very soon. It's in the papers today that the price of oil may rise to about 150. But that is if we do not fight and the masses must fight. Struggle is the life of the masses they would fight, but we need to organize them. So all of us must find the way, the road to the masses. We must begin to organize 
in our various organizations, communities, states where we live, so that the Nigerian people are able to replicate what happened in 2012, which led ultimately to the collapse of the PDP. But when we do that, we must also organize politically. We must not fold our arms politically. We must learn to work on two legs. One, participation to improve the lot of our people and also political organization so that even if it is one local government we are able to capture electorally, we can set an, ex an example of how a pro-people government can be. In 2003, I campaigned to be governor of your state on a program of a governor on a worker's wage. Let us prepare for the battles ahead. Let us prepare around a resistance to in the impending increase in the price of oil. Let us insist that the minimum gain we can make in this COVID-19 era is a declaration of free medical care, prohibition of the rulers from embarking on medical tourism, the COVID-19 funds that have been mobilized to be devoted to upgrade our hospitals. Our government said they have devoted two trillion naira COVID-19 uh, stimulus package but they have mobilized. I have tracked all the funds. They have mobilized about 40 trillion Naira, equivalent to about $104 billion, including the recently announced 15 trillion Naira for infrastructural development by the CBN. Unless we fight to ensure that these funds are utilized to attend to the basic needs of Nigerian people. These funds would be captured by the ruling class, by the big business. Concentrated funds in the hands of a few will facilitate political capture and it will facilitate economic and political exclusion. Let us organize politically and on pressure group basis in trying to change the lives of our people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Comrade Aborishade. Uh, Yemi, can you please uh, round off for us uh, final comments? Thank you. Um, I guess mine will be a combination of Larry's and Comrade Femi's that organization and a organization, organizing across our different groups is just too critical. It's too critical um, where Political, in terms of political ideology, we differ and to some degree. But I think ultimately, if all of us are fighting for the same cause in terms of uh, Nigeria that works for all, Nigeria that's just to all, and a country where any Nigerian has the ability to, to um, take a, leverage the resources of the state or be, I guess, be benefits, that's the word, benefit from the resources of the state. It's one of the things, for example, in for those of us that are in sort of organized civil society or NGO, when we look at elections, so we focus a lot on civic education. So when you get there, you stand in line, you vote this way, you vote that way. But we don't pay enough attention to political education because by the time you are voting on election day, the, the choices that are before you have already been predetermined within the structure where you're operating. So that, at least for, as for, for example, as an organization, it's something that we're committed to spending a lot more time on in helping citizens understand the context for this democracy that we're talking about or voting on election day. Because if you don't understand the politics of it or the context within which you are voting, then the decisions that you make or how you choose to exercise that, that vote will be hampered and you probably will not make the best decision for you. And then secondly, um, the... Yeah, I think I'll just leave it. I'll, I'll really just leave it at that. That we really need to organize around, around on letting citizens understand politics. We talk about democracy. I mean, the theme for this is democracy on trial. 
But I think we also underestimate just how much people don't understand what democracy means and what it comes with. I spoke earlier about employing people to work for you. There are three things that I, I, I like to talk about in terms of the context for the democracy that, that, we, that we run. One is our culture. I'm, I'm a Yoruba girl at heart. No, I'm a Yoruba girl, not just a heart, but I'm a Yoruba girl. And our culture defers to adults. You defer to elders. And there's a way that that can be manipulated in ways that people don't ask questions and people don't challenge people in, lead, in positions of authority because you've been framed not to for the most part. Secondly, I believe to a certain degree, we probably underestimate just how much our experience with military rule frames how people relate to government. So government is them. So we leave government to do whatever they want to do and you stay away from government. And lastly, religion. I firmly believe that the way religion is, is framed within Nigeria paralyzes Nigeria. All right, it looks like uh, Yemi's um, line is frozen. Yemi, can you hear me? Yes, to a large degree. So three forces. And I think across socioeconomic groups as well, frames how we respond to a lot of these issues. So there's a lot of work to be done. And I'll speak for myself personally. There's a sense that sometimes we assume that these things are logical. So that what we see, there's a linear path. Okay, um, we're having difficulties um, getting the final words from Yemi. Uh, Yemi, are you still there? I came back, sorry, what? I don't know what happened, it disappeared, <laughs> but um, sorry. So I was just trying to say that we, we underestimate, we assume some things are just logical. And at least let me speak for myself. Um, when, I, when I started in this space, I, I did that a lot. I just, I just assume people realize that it's logical. This person is responsible for this rubbish. You hold the person accountable, we have better outcomes. But unfortunately, it's really not that simple. And the work that must be done to educate people and raise awareness and raise consciousness is a lot. It's systemic work, it's consistent work, it's hard work. And we must realize, and it's, it's yeah, and we must realize the, the need for that, um, for the results that we want. Sorry, right. thanks, Fido. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. Okay, so let's go to Omoya Lesho, right, to give us his uh, final comment. Well, thank you so much uh, for putting this together. And uh, I, all I have to say is that a lot of uh, work needs to be done and would have to be done. And there is no doubt about it that um, Nigerian from this moribund uh, condition of democracy to a live democracy, democratic process that meets all the tenets of democracy, uh, that has all the features of democracy, and uh, can benefit and suit the people. Everything you're seeing in Nigeria today has been designed to disempower and disembowel its people, uh, its military, its uh, political institutions, judicial institutions, the executive uh, uh, system in place here. Everything is designed to achieve the result that it's achieving today, make people be fearful, be poor, and subservient. And only a totally uh, re-engineered mindset. You know, that's why we use the word revolution. It can bring a completely different nation, country. Uh, I mean, that can transform this space from a country to a nation, which is not right now. So, and uh, we just hope uh, those who are watching, who are emboldened, who are getting educated, people who are getting conscientized and fully mobilized to the barricades, we continue to push until uh, we can push this pain, suffering, and hardship over the cliff. Now, uh, before you go, uh, Shore, uh, a lot of comments were on our social media here, uh, almost 700. And, and some people wanted to know how you are dealing with the fact that you are still uh, in Nigeria, you've not been able to see your family and uh, form over a year. Uh, what, is, what do you say to them? Well, you know, the, the easy way to say it is to say that it is a sacrifice that is needed uh, for you know, my conviction and 
Yeah. Some other ways too, I think, uh, uh, you know, when people are confronted with the kind of uh, peculiar situation that we found ourselves, they just have to understand that uh, you will have to suffer the consequences of your action. And others who are not taking action will also be suffering the consequences of their inaction. So um, I feel terrible that I haven't seen my kids. I've, since uh, I had my kids, since I've been married 16, almost 16 years ago, never been away from my wife for more than two months or three months at a time. Kids, uh, same amount of time, but suddenly uh, become a digital father who can only be rich uh, on the internet, sadly. Uh, but hey, you know, just as I'm in that condition, there are a lot of people who, in the millions, are suffering in the same manner here in Nigeria. You know, they're with their family, but they can't see them because, you know, there's the wall created between them uh, of hunger, starvation, disease, misery. So we, we just have to, we just have to do this once and for all so that every family, uh, every father can mean something to their children and every child can mean something to their dad as well. So, uh, so that's, that's the situation. Now, now, one last thing, we are out of time, but I, I must say this to you. Um, if you make, if you have any interview or post any video on social media, people comment. And one of the comments they, they make is they say to you that Nigeria is not worth fighting for. Why are you wasting your time fighting for Nigerians? What do you say to people who, who leave such comments? You know, I when I see such comments, I and that is that's how I understand that I'm a Nigerian and I'm in Nigeria. Um, we are very interesting people. You know, these are the same people who fight for George Floyd, you know, <laughs> like on the internet, like they fight for Black Lives Matter, but when it comes to their own lives, they don't care, you know. Uh, so, but you should also not use, you know, and I think you taught me this a long time ago, that sometimes when people come on the internet and they see comments that are good, 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 it's just by nature, they want to put bad comments. Because they know that bad comments will attract more attention. So, so I don't judge people basically because they've written something on that. There's also a lot of people who under those comments are learning, you know. Uh, they're learning new things. I remember like majority of the people who became converts to Sahara Reporter, the people who used to hate Sahara Reporters for a living. And then suddenly they started getting used to the idea that our stories are true and true and true. And then they become residents of truth and the website. So I, I don't take every comment, you know, the first value. I, I think sometimes people are also just reluctant to fight. And they, every time they see you challenging them, challenging their conscience, you know, and forcing them somehow to be part of a struggle that they're not really interested in, they do everything they can, not to throw barbs at you, but to kind of free themselves from you know, what it seems like you're dragging them, you know, like they say in Nigeria, they say you're dragging them like tiger generator, you know, to come and fight. And they don't want to fight. So their own way of saying, look, I don't want to fight is to tell you, stop fighting, stop disturbing us with, uh, with your fight. But that doesn't mean that in general, they don't appreciate what they're doing. I mean, look at today, you know, all the mobilization we did, it was just, you know, using our credibility, integrity, and I will say to people, you know, you can fight. And as, at this point, we already have 13 cities that uh, hack into that core. All right. Thank you so you much. Know, and oh. lots of people protest. Mm. Yes. Thank you for Thank you so here. much for joining us, okay? I, I want to use this opportunity to thank all our guests. Uh, um, Yemi, uh, Comrade Aborisha uh, Day, Dele, uh, Lanre, everybody that, that is here, and Gomez, who, who was my co-host. Um, thank you so much for, for coming, and I hope those who watch at home will continue uh, with the conversation. We are actually um, looking at um, your comments, and, and other people are getting engaged, and that's what we want to achieve with the town hall structure, where we keep um, having this conversation and, and let other people air their opinions. Uh, we hope to continue with this series and uh, hope you will continue to join us as we go along. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Thank you so much. See you guys next time.